Thursday, the final session of Greenlight Guru True Quality Virtual Summit. I hope you've had the chance to enjoy the last few days of learning actionable tips, trends, and best practices to achieve true quality for your medical devices and business. This session is on digital health and remote monitoring devices, the impact of COVID-19 on their regulation. My name is Taylor Brown and I'm a med device guru here at Greenlight Guru and I will be your moderator for today's special session. Uh, I know our speaker, Allison Komiyama, is really looking forward to sharing her experience working with device companies during COVID-19 and diving into how they were impacted by three specific FDA guidance documents. Before we dive too deep in today's presentation and introduce our speaker and her company, acknowledge regulatory strategies, I'll touch on a few housekeeping items. First of all, the session will run for about 45 minutes and will include a Q&A session at the end where Allison has been kind enough to answer your questions. So I encourage you to submit your questions throughout the presentation as they may come up in the box on your right-hand side and we will get to as many of them as time permits. As you heard me say, this is the final session. This is it. This is the final session of the True Quality Virtual Summit. We've hoped that you've learned, connected, gained inspiration over the three-day event. All sessions and handouts will be able for replay at virtualsummit.greenlight.guru. Many hours of entertainment to come after today's final session. Um, I'd also like to share a few words about Greenlight Guru and why we put on this free virtual summit. If you've been on one of our training sessions before, then you know we put these on because improving the quality of life is our mission here at Greenlight. Likely a similar mission as many of you at today's summit. Anything we can do as an organization which helps device makers bring safer, life-changing devices to market quicker and with less risk aligns to that mission. We're constantly looking for ways to fulfill that mission, whether that's through hosting free events, training sessions, through partnering with world-class medical device consultants, or through our award-winning medical device QMS software. If you would like to learn more about why medical device companies from across the globe are moving away from paper-based general purpose QMS and adopting our purpose-built medical device quality management software, I encourage you to head on over to www.greenlight.guru after today's presentation to schedule your free personalized one-on-one -on -one demo. Now, on to today's presentation. Let me give her a proper introduction. Allison Komiyama is a former FDA reviewer who started Acknowledge Regulatory Strategies in order to serve clients who manufacture implantable and other patient contacting medical devices. She received her PhD in neuroscience from Stanford and her BA in molecular and cell biology from University of California, Berkeley. She received her regulatory affairs certification for the US in 2014. While working at the FDA as a biologist and reviewer in the Office of Device Evaluation, Allison was a lead reviewer and consult on 510K pre-market notifications, pre-subs, investigational device exemption, which also IDE, applications and pre-market approval submissions. Her specialty was in biocompatibility requirements for implanted devices. She also researched neurotoxicity and systemic to toxicity of MEN device in the Office of Science and Engineering Labs in support of FDA recognized ISO and ASTM standards. After her time at FDA, Allison worked as a project manager and regulatory affairs manager at an IVD company, as well as senior regulatory specialist and director of regulatory affairs at two consulting firms. Allison, without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Thank you so much. Can you hear me all right? Yep, you sound great. All right, um, I will, full disclosure, there was like a little bar that popped up that said my microphone was having issues. So I hope that's, only because you were talking. And <laughs> so far, so reason. good. <laughs> oh my gosh. I feel like I, I want to think that Greenlight Guru saved the best to last the talk, you know, because this is a very interesting topic. Um, but at the same time, I realize I am what's standing in the way of uh, a lot of East Coasters and people that uh, might have a happy hour uh, to go to <laughs> or family to go back to. So uh, I will try to keep this uh, exciting and fun and uh, interesting and uh, won't be offended if you log out. I, uh, you know, usually at the end of a conference, there's only two people in the room. So I'm just going to assume 
that is just two people and myself. And, um, you know, I, I guess that is the benefit of a virtual conference is hopefully there are still people logging in. <laughs> so, um, anyway, with all that said, uh, I would just want to say thank you to Greenlight Guru for uh, having me, pre- uh, allowing me to present on this topic. Uh, and also just for being such a great uh, resource and ally for medical device companies, as well as uh, patients out there and other consultants like myself uh, in regulatory affairs. So I uh, started Acknowledge, as you said, in 2014. Um, and uh, this is the website. If Feel free to go to the link. I find that most people go to the website for our blog. Um, it's not as well read, I think, as the Greenlight Guru blog and podcast, which I recommend uh, people check out as well. Uh, but uh, the other thing to check out is uh, the link at the top of our website currently. We do host an annual uh, conference in August. We started actually last year. We had to push the one this coming August, unfortunately, to next year. Uh, but all of the speakers are former FDA reviewers. And we talk about, we just totally nerd out for three days about uh, regulations on medical devices. So if you are interested and you want some really good insight into what the black box of FDA kind of looks like uh, and what your submissions do once they get to FDA, uh, check out that link. And uh, yeah, thanks again, Dreamlight Guru. So without further ado, I'm going to kick it off. See if my computer works. All right. So let's go to 2019. I feel like um, I wanted to start with, let's talk about where we are, where we were and where we are. Um, So 2019 for a lot of people was the worst year ever. You know, I had a lot of people say, oh my gosh, you know, this is, when is it going to end? I can't wait for 2020 to be here. Um, You know, impeachment happened, um, Brexit and the whole MDD to MDR shift. I know that really impacted the medical device industry. Um, We had a global uh, climate crisis, still do. We had um, like 70,000 deaths for uh, for overdose, with most of those being opioid use related overdose deaths in the US. Uh, If you saw Game of Thrones and you saw the last episode, that was garbage. Um, And then Grumpy Cat died. That was the other thing I looked up and I was like, oh my gosh, 2019, you're horrible. You killed Grumpy Cat. So I I think all of us were excited to get to 2020 until, um, you know, 2020 said, hey, hold my beer. And uh, we had coronavirus uh, starting in really January and February. And everything changed. The world has changed. Regulations have changed. uh, And nothing is the same. I think a lot of people keep saying, when do we go back to normal? I want to get back to normal. And I think we can all agree uh, normal doesn't exist anymore, or it's going to be a, a definitely a new normal, uh, especially with regard to regulations with uh, medical devices and um, and just how we treat each other. Hopefully it's a little kinder at the end of the day. So one of the things I wanted to talk about uh, and go way back to the 80s uh, is to talk about FDA's role in preventing the spread of HIV and AIDS. So this is not the first time we've seen a pandemic. Uh, and FDA uh, in 1985, you know, really, actually, you can go to this website, I've included the links at the bottom, but it sort of talks about how FDA uh, supported the, you know, through regulations and through um, approval of test kits and drugs, how they supported uh, preventing the spread of HIV and AIDS. Uh, I think, and I hope, I should say, in five years, 10 years, 40 years down the line, we will also have a website like this on the FDA's website that, or a link on the FDA's website that talks about uh, FDA's role in preventing the spread of coronavirus. So uh, I think we can all agree that we're very happy to live in 2020 when test kits um, don't take a full year. Like if you actually read the fine print on this slide, you'll read that it took a full year for an HIV test kit to be released after uh, after HIV was actually uh, was uh, announced and I you know I think a lot of people recently have been saying oh my gosh the you know testing is so slow like when are we actually going to get testing um I think there are definite issues with how people uh, or the you know the, the bottleneck for some of the test kits and whatnot but the fact that we are able to get testing uh and actual test kits uh within the first few weeks after uh, COVID-19 was announced and the, and the declaration hit is pretty phenomenal. So um, 
I encourage you to read this page and uh, also to think about how FDA is really involved in um, really being the solution to try and get us out of this crisis. At least part of the solution, I should say. So one of the things that I uh, do with my, with my uh, employees in my office is we have something called, like, uh, called a journal club, and we take proposed guidances uh, for the, every year, um, and these are released or announced in uh, the previous year. So in 2019, FDA put together this list, and they called the A-list, the B-list, and the retrospective review list. And the A-list is the list of prioritized device guidance documents that the agency intends to publish during the next fiscal year. B-list is the ones you know, with adequate resources that they hope to uh, publish. And then they do a retrospective review where they look at previous documents. So from 1980, uh, there's one about microwaves this year, 1990, 2000, and they decide whether or not they need to be revised or deleted. I use the FDA's list for guidance documents, proposed guidance documents, almost as a, a litmus or sort of the canary in the coal mine to figure out what's coming down the pipeline or what, what are the things that FDA is uh, uh, concerned about or what are they getting interested in? And I think one of the telling things in this past year, at least looking through this list, and if you go to that link, you can see the three uh, lists that FDA put out, um, really was um, third-party review. I was very interested in reading that guidance document that did come out in March. Um, the Safer Technologies Program, I think that's really exciting. It's sort of a similar uh, pathway as the Breakthrough Devices Program. Uh, two others that really struck my interest were uh, the Clinician Decision Support Software. So it's a software as a medical device. And also the guidance on content for pre-market submissions for management of cybersecurity. So you can tell that FDA is thinking about digital health. They're thinking about software. They're thinking about cybersecurity. They know that these things are on the forefront of a lot of our minds. And so they are providing guidance to try and help us understand their current thinking uh, about those topics. So, you know, the guidance documents are not final, you know, or I'm sorry, I should say they're not binding. And oftentimes they will release a draft guidance document that's not quite final, but at least we start to get an understanding of what FDA is thinking about uh, and how they're planning on potentially regulating it in the future. So um, I wanted to have a slide. I'm only going to talk about the two first bullets here, and then I'm going to leave the three for the end. But I call these my pandemic pontifications. <laughs> so just to think about things out loud with you all, um, and by all means, uh, include some questions at the end. I think these, these are more um, thought-provoking topics that I wanted to talk about. Um, so what do the recent guidance documents tell us? Uh, so as I covered in the last slide, you know, you can start understanding what FDA is thinking about and, uh, and how they're going to regulate things. What's their current thinking about certain topics? The next thing is, where are they coming from? I think a lot of people ask, like, where do these guidance documents come from? I think, um, you know, there are a couple answers here. Uh, one is if they know, you know, based on going to trade shows, you know, reviewers will go to trade shows, they will go, uh, you know, or they might get internal signals about um, some uh, failures of devices or recalls. And so they'll understand that there's something happening in a specific field and they need to come out with a guidance document to explain their current thinking on it. Um, there are a few cases where, you know, FDA is a, a government agency, so there might be political uh, interests as well. So there have been a few cases I've heard of that a guidance document might get um, authored from sort of the top levels, maybe the, the office of the commissioner, uh, and it will get released. And the reviewers, you know, might not be floated by reviewers, but based on, um, you know, interests at the agency, they might push guidance documents through. And the ones I'm going to talk about today, I believe, were more uh, reviewer driven and were really the um, the brain children uh, of FDA's digital health group and some of the, the groups with the um, neuro based devices. So. I want to talk a little bit about what is a digital health device. Hopefully, you know a little bit about it if you're um, sitting here listening to me. Uh, but if not, I wanted to let you know that this is something that FDA is very interested in. Um, the, they released the Digital Health Innovation Action Plan um, not too long ago and uh, really expressed their interest in uh, understanding and how do they protect and promote public health with using these digital health innovation um, uh, devices or, or products. 
So uh, when you think of digital health, you might think of a mobile uh, mobile health or wearable app or wearable devices, telehealth, telemedicine. Um, some of the common terms you might hear are um, MMAs, uh, which is not the, the wrestling or the fighting. Um, it's mobile medical applications. So maybe a medical device that's on your phone. Uh, software is a medical device. So a purely software device that might be either run on a computer or also could be run on your phone. Um, it might be for analysis of images, let's say. Um, another one, so that's also called SAMD, you might hear it called that. Um, CDS or CDSS, which is uh, Clinician Decision Support Software. Uh, and finally, AI, ML, so um, artificial intelligence and machine learning devices. So FDA has provided a lot of guidance on those. They're hot topics to talk about. Um, I recommend uh, if you do have a chance to go to the, the DTX or digital therapeutics, um, conference that happens, I think, twice a year. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they're going to go virtual this year, but you will meet a lot of the companies that um, have these digital health devices, and they're fascinating. And I think um, the device, uh, or I'm sorry, the guidance documents that I'll talk about today uh, will definitely impact that community. So let's go to COVID. Um, if, you if you type in COVID into the guidance document search, and I did this again this morning to make sure that the numbers were still the same, there are 46 entries, 46 guidance documents that refer to COVID. Um, these, I think one of the most impressive things here is that these all were released as a final guidance document since March of this year. And that's very impressive. I mean, they're not short guidance documents, many of them, and, and uh, 46 of them coming out of FDA. Uh, I think we all understand why FDA reviewers are working hard. They are also working from home and why they uh, are slammed. They have a lot of work on their plates at the moment. I would say that this industry has not slowed down. If anything, things have really picked up and um, it's no different for reviewers. So I'm going to talk about two main guidance documents today. Um, I actually included just uh, links to the last three. Um, I'm not going to touch on them as much. I'm happy to uh, talk with you afterwards, or if you would like to submit questions, by all means, for the other ones. But the two that I think have been most impactful, and this one uh, came out in March, I believe, 16th or 17th, uh, and it was it's called the enforcement policy for non-invasive remote monitoring devices used to support patient monitoring during COVID-19 public health emergency. This was a really interesting guidance document to see, and it was the third one released uh, about COVID. So it was, you know, I think we got the shelter in place order um, March 16th here in San Diego, where I am based. And within a few days, this guidance document came out. So you know that they were already working on it, that you know that they already had a, an idea that this was going to be a crisis and that remote monitoring devices or non-invasive remote monitoring devices would be a huge benefit for patients, for healthcare providers, and for industry to understand what how FDA was uh, planning on enforcing these devices. So I'm going to apologize up front. I, um, there's a lot of writing on these slides. I've tried to have a uh, focus in specific areas, whether it be in a red box or on blue writing. So um, I'll try and focus your attention. Um, so FDA, in these guidance documents, they will provide sort of an introduction of like, why are they you know, releasing this guidance document? It's a fair question. Um, so they, uh, for this guidance in, in particular, they said they're issuing this guidance to provide a policy to help expand the availability and capability of non-invasive remote monitoring devices to facilitate patient monitoring. So, and it, the next lines are very important. So to reduce patient and healthcare provider contact and exposure to COVID-19. This makes a heck of a lot of sense. If you want to uh, reduce your chance of getting COVID, um, you want to remotely monitor uh, patients or you want yourself to stay home. Let's say you're, you know, you have a monitoring device that you can use at home and you can send information to your doctor. Maybe the doctor will say, you know, I don't think you're ready to get to come into the ER or, oh my gosh, you know, looking at your, your vitals, I think it's time for you to come in. Um, it will save you, you know, um, probably the time to go if you don't need to go back and forth to the hospital. Um, I think the other benefit, which um, isn't spelled out here, but which is very clear, is that if you're remotely monitoring someone, you don't need to maybe glove up or gown up every single time you enter the room. Maybe the person's intubated and or they're in a, in a drug-induced coma uh, to go and check on them to make sure that their uh, medications are titrated appropriately. 
uh, you don't want to have to go in all the time. If you can have a, a device that is able to monitor them and reliably and accurately monitor them, that's an important uh, aspect. Uh, absolutely, uh, you, it would free up the resources of the healthcare provider. They might be able to see more patients. I think that was another concern is, you know, how much these uh, hospitals were impacted. So uh, there's a lot of benefits here to this guidance document. Uh, as I mentioned, it's a final guidance document. So this bottom box um, that says, but it remains subject to comment. Um, there is a link here at the bottom. Uh, that you can click on and enter the docket number that's there and uh, you can comment on this uh, guidance document and FDA welcomes that. And you can also see, read other public guidance, uh, public uh, comments that people have put in on this guidance document. Some of them are very interesting. Um, so the other thing you can do is there is an email address for uh, Jessica <laughs> at FDA. I did not include her email address on this, but you can look up the guidance document and reach out to her if you have questions about this guidance. So a little bit about the guidance uh, devices covered in this guidance. So FDA has really spelled out which ones they believe are uh, remote monitoring devices. So these include electronic thermometers, electrocardiographs, cardiac monitors, uh, pulse oximetry, uh, non-invasive blood pressure, respiratory rate breathing frequency devices, and electronic stethoscopes. So you can see the regulation number. That's the uh, where in the Code of Federal Regulation these devices are uh, regulated, and then also the product code that these devices fall under. So if you have a device that is within that product code, it is appropriate to use this guidance document. Um, I just wanna say for these non-invasive uh, uh, devices, what FDA really intends is that, you know, they possibly have uh, the potential to have Bluetooth, Wi-Fi, or cellular connectivity to transmit a patient's measurements either directly to the healthcare provider or to another monitoring entity. Um, some of these devices uh, have the potential to add a new algorithm or apply an algorithm that might transform a patient's physiological parameters into a, a, either a novel index or an alarm that might help the healthcare provider in the diagnosis of a particular condition or disease, especially COVID-19. All right, so a little bit about the policy. Uh, FDA has stated in this guidance document that they do not intend to object. And I know that's sort of a funny way of putting it, but uh, hear me out here. They do not intend to object to limit the modifications of the indications, claims, or functionality of a hardware or software of a cleared device. So if you want to modify the indications of your device, let's say, um, that's used to support patient monitoring, um, that is acceptable. And that is what's contained in this guidance document. So examples of this, they've said, if you want to include a monitoring statement, uh, related to patients with COVID-19 or if they have a coexisting condition, such as heart hypertension or heart failure. I think there have been, uh, there are a lot of comorbidities that have been shown with COVID-19. Um, if the subject device or the device that you have is previously cleared and it's only for hospital use, FDA is also interested in um, allowing, or again, they will do not intend to object if you plan to uh, change the indications to use in a home setting. This is really uh, exciting for regulators like me, our regulatory consultants like myself, because I, if you know what it takes to get a home use device, um, you'll know that this was a, a, a big thing for FDA to um, include in this guidance document, because going from a hospital prescription only use device to a home base or home use device usually includes a lot of testing. It would absolutely need a 510K, but again, um, when looking at the benefit risk ratio of this device uh, or the, or these types of devices, absolutely the benefit outweighs the risk here. And so uh, that's uh, again, captured within this guidance document. And then finally for if there might be hardware or software changes, and I mentioned that on the previous slide. So if there's again, a, an ability for your device to be connected via Bluetooth or wireless or Wi-Fi. So there are three parts to this guidance document. I've broken them into A, B, and C. So um, this is a little redundant, so I'll go through this one quickly, but the modifications to FDA cleared indications, claims, or functionality, again, they do not intend to object if you decide to modify your indications, claims, or functionality, and you do not need a pre-market notification if it does, if your device does not create an undue risk. They do have a list of undue risks 
uh, in the guidance document that you should check out, make sure that you're not tripping um, that list. But you do not need a 510K. Uh, the device, and so for the next three items, they said that the device is um, intended for the purpose of displaying, printing, or analyzing the physiological parameters. Uh, if the device is intended for the purpose of supporting or providing adjunctive recommendations to the healthcare provider or the, or the patient, and uh, one of the important things is the healthcare provider and or the patient, uh, depending on the device, if they can independently review the basis for any diagnostic or treatment recommendations. So if they're able to uh, see the recommendation that the device provides, however, they're able to also um, independently review the data that uh, supported that recommendation. That's an important part of this guidance. I wanted to include a couple examples here. Um, so uh, based on this indication expansion, so vital patch, um, if, and actually I just Googled uh, FDA COVID um, remote monitoring devices, and these are the first two that popped up. So vital patch uh, was granted actually an emergency use, use authorization for monitoring COVID-19 patients. Um, very interesting, they got um, what's called QT intervals, uh, and that device also does a lot of other, um, it's been cleared for many different types of patient monitoring. Koala Life is another one that has, uh, it's a device for AFib and normal sinus rhythm, uh, and they expanded their indications to have lung sounds uh, for, because as you know, um, you know, the electronic stethoscopes could be used to listen to people who might be, um, either uh, having pneumonia symptoms or symptoms associated with COVID. If you go to those two links, you can read more about those two devices. Uh, next is uh, modifications to FDA cleared hardware or software intended to increase remote monitoring availability or capability. Again, if you add um, some sort of algorithm or if you add wireless capability, again, the modifications do not directly affect the physiological parameter measurement algorithms. That's very important. So you wanna make sure um, if you want to fit squarely within this guidance document, make sure um, that you are not actually changing the parameters of the measurement algorithms. Uh, the last but not least, the clinical decision support software. So there is previous guidance about CDSS, uh, but they touched on it very briefly at the end of this guidance document. Um, this is really a device uh, that or it does not fall under the, um, the definition under 201H uh, for medical devices, but you are able to, um, or I guess if you fulfill these four criteria, um, you may be clinician decision support software. So it's not intended to acquire, process, or analyze a medical image or signal. It's intended for the purpose of displaying, analyzing, or printing medical information. It's intended for the purpose of supporting and providing recommendations. And again, the healthcare provider or healthcare professional can independently review the basis for those recommendations. If you fulfill those, and again, there's guidance, uh, additional guidance about CDSS, then um, this guidance also applies to you. Uh, I recommend going to this link. Uh, I, I'm not sure if my pointer is working, but the link at the bottom of the page, it talks about uh, digital health devices. Uh, in, in times of COVID-19, and it just listed out some really interesting devices. One of them is this one that I've posted here, um, a company called Patched. They have um, a mobile medical app. Actually, I just ordered one for myself. <laughs> it's kind of cool. Um, it's on its way, but it connects to a thermometer. It connects to um, a pulse oximeter. So that's the, the thing in orange there. And then it will uh, give you information about your your temperature and your um, pulse, your SpO2 measurements, um, and it will help you track those. And um, it it, full, it falls squarely within this clinician decision support software um, as you share that information with your, your healthcare provider. All right, so I'm going to move on to the next guidance document. So this one was very exciting for us also to, also to see. This came out in April of this year um, and it was enforcement policy for digital health devices for treating psychiatric disorders during the coronavirus disease 2019. Um, I I think I, why I was kind of nerding out on this is I've met a lot of companies you know as I mentioned in, in the DTX conference that have uh, digital health therapeutic devices or diagnostic devices um, which actually diagnostic devices, I should say, are not co covered within this guidance document. I do hope that FDA releases one for uh, diagnostic devices. 
but um, a lot of companies have really powerful therapeutic devices, uh, th digital therapeutic devices uh, that uh, this really changed the world for them. And I think a lot of companies are trying to figure out how to incorporate this and how to get their therapies to uh, into distribution based on this guidance. So uh, again, they have the introduction. FDA put in an introduction paragraph here. <clears throat> FDA issued this guidance to provide a policy to help expand the availability of digital health therapeutic devices for psychiatric disorders uh, to facilitate consumer and patient use while reducing user and healthcare provider contact and patient exposure to COVID-19. I think one of the, the things I um, worried about, and I, I think a lot of us did, is you know a lot of our friends and family are alone at this time, and people are cut off oftentimes from the therapies and treatments that they're able to get, um, especially for psychiatric disorders. If you were seeing a psychiatrist, um, and all of a sudden you you are supposed to shelter at home and you're not supposed to go out, um, you know this might trigger. Um, you know, a worsening of your symptoms. And I think what I'm nervous about is that we might see a backslide of, you know, of substance use disorder and, um, you know, the opioid epidemic. All of a sudden people are home and they don't have their jobs anymore. They've, you know, been laid off. And um, there's just a lot that people are dealing with at the moment. And I think for FDA to say that these devices uh, have a benefit and you know, really understand that there really is no one therapy that cures everybody. And so to allow companies and allow patients this access is really powerful. So I, I applaud FDA for putting this guidance document out. And um, if you read the second box here, uh, they've listed a few of the examples and it really is psychiatric disorders that are part of the DSM-5. Um, and these includes things like, um, depression, alcohol use disorder, anxiety, insomnia, suicidality, autism, attention deficit disorder, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder, and PTSD. Uh, you can understand why people being stuck at home dealing with these things, um, they need something. And oftentimes these digital health devices um, can be an answer for them. So uh, if you are interested in learning more about it, there is an email address um, that FDA is listed in the guidance document. You can also leave a comment if you click on that link and enter the docket number. So the CBT or computerized behavioral therapy devices, um, it's um, defined uh, in, I guess there's three things that define this. Um, so they, they've defined it per 21 CFR 882.5801, which is a computerized behavioral therapy, or I'm gonna call it CBT device for psychiatric disorders. These are considered class two. They're prescription use typically. Device code is, um, our product code is PWE. And they are intended to provide a computerized version of condition-specific behavioral therapy. Uh, they operate, I guess the, the next definition uh, for digital health, health therapeutic device for psychiatric, psychiatric disorders that operates using uh, maybe a different fundamental technology than is outlined in 21 CFR 82.5801. Um, but it's intended to treat patients with psychiatric conditions are also subject to this guidance document. Uh, and finally, variations of computerized behavioral therapy devices. So this is kind of the catch-all at the bottom um, that might be outside the scope of that regulation, um, such as non-prescription devices is also subject to this guidance. Uh, examples of PWE devices, there's actually only three that have either, uh, the first one was done with via de novo, and um, then there were two more. One of them was recently cleared, that's Somrist for insomnia, and then Reset and Reset O are for substance use uh, disorder and uh, for opioid substance use disorder. So uh, there's a link there at the bottom to learn more about care therapeutics. Very cool devices. Next, uh, they talk about the low-risk general wellness devices and digital health products for mental health or psychiatric uh, conditions. So there is another guidance document for general wellness devices, and they mention that, um, and they say that you might also meet the definition um, for general wellness, uh, or that you do, I'm sorry, that you do meet the definition of a device under 201H of the Act, uh, but it's really intended for general wellness, and it presents a low risk to safety of users or and other persons. They are saying that you also fall within this guidance document. So the big thing is that FDA said that they're going to use enforcement discretion. They do not intend to object to the distribution and use of computerized behavioral therapy devices and other digital health therapeutic devices for psychiatric disorders. 
the amazing thing here is if you go down to the four bullets at the bottom is that FDA is saying that they do not need a pre-market notification under 510K. So you don't need a 510K submission. You don't need to have reports of corrections and removals requirements, uh, registration and listing requirements are waived, and the UDI identification requirements um, are not required. With this said, I do encourage you to go back to Kyle Rose's talk this morning and download it because he talks about quality systems. And I think it is in everyone's best interest to have a solid quality system uh, either in effect or underway, or, you know, start working on it. Even if you decide to start distributing your device, it's going to help you in the long run, uh, especially if, as the uh, declaration is lifted. Uh, you want to make sure that you're in a good place to get your device um, either through a 510K or a de novo at that time. Uh, to wrap up with this guidance document, so um, they, I think this, this first bullet is the one that uh, kind of blew a lot of minds. Um, FDA does not intend to enforce compliance with the special controls identified uh, in product code PWE or under that regulation 882.5801, which includes the requirement of prospective clinical data. So FDA is saying they actually don't need to see clinical data or, you know, um, it's not a requirement uh, that you follow that special control um, to, or I, I should say, they do not intend to enforce compliance. So um, again, as you move forward and are collecting real world evidence and are, uh, you know, seeing your device work, uh, hopefully in real time, I think it is wise for you to collect that information as best you can. Uh, and include that, uh, you know, and, and really study that for when the time comes that you might need to put that in a submission, pre-market submission. Again, they talk about uh, devices that are low risk, general wellness devices. They don't intend to enforce those. And finally, they added this last line, which I liked, that FDA does not regulate software for video conferencing, even when intended for use in telemedicine. So um, that is not under FDA's oversight. Just the last three guidance documents, I just want to touch on, I included the links here, but FDA put out a guidance for remote ophthalmic assessment monitoring devices, uh, for non-invasive fetal and maternal monitoring devices. Again, you don't want women, pregnant women coming into the hospital uh, every day, I think, as a lot of uh, women in the last few weeks of their pregnancy need to come in if they can be monitored uh, remotely. And then also remote digital pathology devices. So just to end, um, I'm sorry, I've gone two minutes over. Um, I think, you know, and I touched on this in previous slides, is, you know, how does FDA and how do we, uh, from, in, from industry's perspective, really measure benefit risk in time of COVID-19? I think the guidance documents really show that FDA sees uh, the potential benefit for these devices and was willing to, um, you know, lift regulation or, or allow for enforcement discretion um, to see if there's, you know, if we can get these devices to people that need them. Um, where do we go from here? I think I've, that's a question that I've been getting from a lot of clients is, you know, what do I do with my device? Where do I go from here? Um, as I said, it's wise to start collecting information, understand the real world evidence um, value that you can get here. Also be, be wary, you know, don't, um, don't just release your device um, and not know what you're, you know, what sort of labeling you're allowed to state or, um, you know, not have it properly controlled. So I think, you know, be aware that even though FDA has these guidance documents, it's uh, absolutely in your best interest uh, to have a quality system and, um, you know, really understand the power of, uh, of studying your device in, in real time. I think the last thing I just want to talk about is how do things go back to normal? And I had a client say, oh, I can't wait to get back to normal. I just want to get back to normal. <laughs> I said, there is no more normal. We can't go back. That's, you know, four months ago. Um, and I think it's hard uh, uh, to put things back in, you know, someone said, this is like Pandora's box. And it's, like, it's hard to get everything back into that box. I think we will see a shift in how FDA views these devices. I think the digital health group, you know, um, at FDA really encouraged uh, uh, you know, uh, these types of devices uh, when they would come to FDA. And I think now it's it's sort of a, a grand experiment um, and I think a worthy one. So we will see. I think once uh, the declaration is over, um, it will be very interesting to see how FDA 
backs up and says, you know, how they want to regulate these things moving forward. I think even when the pandemic's over, we're still going to have a lot of psychiatric um, issues. Uh, our communities will have psychiatric issues um, just based on what they're going through. So it will be interesting to see uh, how FDA, you know, if they allow a grace period or if there is um, some smoother transition. So with that, I want to say thank you again. Thanks, Greenlight Guru. You guys are awesome. Um, and yeah, I really appreciate being able to present today. So thank you. There's more than two people giving you a round of applause right now. It's not like we're in a live <laughs> conference. <laughs> it's just a slow golf clap. It's just a slow clap. <laughs> Allison, thank you so much. What what a great presentation to end on. So many exciting things happening in the digital health space. Um, audience, if you have any questions, please submit them in the right sidebar. We have a couple um, questions coming here at the end. Someone just, again, confirming that there's more than one person out here. <laughs> <laughs> if you are a company and you know you are close to being a digital health but there's also some things of you know software as a med device that you're looking at you're thinking is this me am i a digital health where would you go to get more information about you know what regulations you should be following and what guidance you need to be paying attention to sure I think, you know, FDA has put together a wealth of information on their website. Uh, I think there's also, dare I say it, Greenlight Guru has a lot of really great webinars and podcasts on this exact topic. Um, and I, I encourage you to go look there. You're always welcome to reach out to regulatory consultants. I think, you know, I when I saw the deluge of guidance documents coming out, um, I mean, I, I feel like we just kind of grabbed our popcorn and we're just like, oh my gosh, <laughs> this, is, this is wild. Um, so, you know, I, I, I have been keeping fairly close tabs on what's being released. I know there's newsletters that come out every day. So I also encourage you to, to go to FDA.gov and, you know, register uh, to get the daily newsletters or the updates. I think you can opt into certain ones and not others, um, but definitely the guidance document one. There's always something interesting coming out. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, something that I'm sitting here and, and it sounds like at least one audience member is in here wondering, um, do you have any recommendations in relationship to real world evidence that will be acceptable for a device either under enforcement discretion or approved through EUA? I know EUA, we were chatting about before this webinar started and, and, and it feels like the Wild West out there. So what recommendations do you have for real world evidence? Excellent question. Um, I think we we don't know too much of how this is going to what this is going to look like in the future, but I do know that there is guidance documents as well for real world evidence. I know um, FDA is trying to put out information on um, you know especially in the public documentation if real world evidence was used. So I, I'm trying to keep tabs on that to understand which submissions are actually using that. Um, you know, I think for OUS data, um, you can oftentimes, uh, you know, glean a lot of information from uh, what clinical trials are going on and, you know, how people are collecting those data. But again, I, I always tell people, go back to FDA. Uh, Kyle Rose said this morning, he's like, oh my gosh, <laughs> sometimes the FDA website can be a bit of a nightmare to navigate. Um, but if you know where to look, if you have the right links, and I tried to uh, include those as best I could in the, in the presentation, uh, there's a lot of information there. There's also CDRH Learn. They have a lot of um, webinars themselves that uh, you can learn about those things. And the Digital Health Group is, uh, has their link and um, they have their transcripts and also their presentations that I have found really helpful, especially uh, as they talk about real world evidence. Absolutely, yeah, lots, lots of good information out there. Um, would you mind touching on the pre-certification uh, pilot program? Uh, for digital health and, and if that will shift the pandemic and, and what's going on uh, with the rush of information here? Gosh, that's a great question and I do not have a great answer. I don't know how that's going to be impacted. I think, um, yeah, that's that's yet to be seen. But I yeah, I'd love, I have a few people that I, I could um, touch base with and see what they have to say about that. Um, yeah, that's definitely going to change. So, absolutely. Yeah, but I know it's it's rather fresh, so yeah. lots of information it coming out. It isn't, right? I feel like the, the pre <laughs> program has been around and testing it 
And uh, but yeah, I don't know how this is going to impact um, really scaling up for that program. Yeah, absolutely. And um, quick question here: Does remote monitoring apply to the Genovo route? I don't totally understand the question. So if it is a device um, that would be appropriate for the de novo pathway, then absolutely. Um, so there might be uh, metrics or some sort of vitals that uh, that we don't really have a great predicate for. And absolutely, the de novo pathway would be appropriate for that. I'm not sure I fully understand this question, but I'm going to give it a stab here. What about software devices which are being created to support alternative therapies, um, which do not have consent coming from who? I think we're talking about, you know, ibuprofen and um, other pharmaceuticals that, in spite of the contradiction, are being found with good uh, results. Um, shall U.S. FDA have something against apps and devices? Say it again, the last part? Uh, I think there's a typo, unfortunately. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> we we may like Ron, okay. Ron Burgundy. You just read, no, just, right? <laughs> just read it. Maybe I'll we'll, we'll, understand. We'll come back to that one. <laughs> um, I think maybe a good place to just kind of end on on a positive note here, Allison. What are some key takeaways about what we can do in the regulatory space, even as we're facing so much uncertainty um, and potential future changes? I mean, who knows what's going to happen three, four weeks from now? Yeah, I think that's such a that's such a bigger question than I know. I'm I'm trying to I'm trying to yeah. <laughs> that's, that's a great way to end though. I feel I mean what I've learned from the the presentations that I've attended and the you know there's just so many people that are excited to be part of the of helping out and be you know look for the helpers right and I think the medical device space hasn't slowed down because I think it's in a unique position to really benefit, you know, um, patients and healthcare providers. And so, you know, when I think about where we were even four or five months ago, I think there was, you know, perceived risk with a lot of digital health devices and, you know, Oh, how are we going to make sure that, you know, uh, you know, I'm not overheard or, you know, I, I don't feel comfortable talking to my doctor on the phone. I'd rather go in. Um, you know, I think a lot of those things have just gone out the window and it's forced us, you know, to, to embrace telehealth and embrace digital health in new ways. That's really um, allowed us to maybe let our guard down a little bit and be more um, open, you know, open to these technologies and these therapies. So I think that's really, that's, that's what I find the most exciting is, you know, I, I do see medical devices as being uh, the big winner here. Um, not, you know, and I don't want to, I don't want that to get perceived as like the big winner, like all these device companies are going to make all this money. Um, but I, I do feel that they, um, at least the, my clients that I talk to and people in industry, when I talk to them, they're so excited to take that entrepreneurial spirit and they see this issue and they're like, how can I help? I've had, you know, uh, companies that say, oh, that other company is trying to do the same thing that we are doing. Um, and they don't use the, the term competitor, right? I, I see more of the times that they say they're trying to do it too. Um, I'm going to call them and we're going to see how we can collaborate. And maybe by joining forces, we can advance things even faster. You know, so I, I see those collaborations. I see uh, people really stepping up, um, doing things for no no profit. I mean, I, I know of a lot of um, test companies that are saying, we have no intention of making any money. We just want to, how do we get our devices to people? How do we, um, you know, really, as I say, be part of the part of the answer here. And that's, yeah, that's a very high note. That's my silver lining when I see everything going on in the world. And I'm just like, ah, <laughs> I do um, find a lot of comfort in um, my clients and also just the devices that I see, um, you know, getting cleared, getting EUAs. And I'm like, that is so cool. That is just such a cool device. And I'm so excited that that's going to help somebody and maybe save someone's life. It sounds so cheesy. I'm sorry, but I, I feel that way. And with that, Allison <laughs> Kamehameha.
<laughs> Acknowledge regulatory strategies. Thank you so much for this this presentation and um, taking us through the world of ever ever changing digital health. Um, of, I know we've gotten a lot of positive comments about the information here. So thank you for your time today. My pleasure. Thanks. All right, team. Well, this is it. This is the last session of the Greenlight Guru True Quality Summit. I want to thank all of you for attending this event. We had over 5,000 medical device professionals from all around the world tuning in, and we hope that you were able to enjoy your time and learn something new. You will be receiving a post-event survey. So please take a moment to complete it and provide us feedback on your experience. We would love to hear it because we wanna do this again. If you want to see more events like this one, definitely follow Greenlight Guru on LinkedIn and subscribe to our blog to be the first to know about future opportunities like this one, or dare I say, maybe even in person. Uh, I hope you're staying safe and well, and I look forward to the next time we are all able to connect. Thank you all so much for attending the 2020 Virtual Summit, and we'll talk to you soon. Bye.